We're in the midst of a huge transformation where our peers, communities, and workplaces are all really melding into one. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giordano, she, her, and hers, and I am the Senior Partnerships Manager here at All Voices. Today, I am very excited to welcome our next guest on the interview series, Mara Strandlund. She's the Chief People Officer at Resilience. Thank you so much for being here. If you want to share a little bit about yourself, for our listeners, including your pronouns, and when you were younger, do you remember how exactly you answered the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Always one of my favorite questions. So thank you so much for, uh, for this opportunity. Pronouns are she and her. Uh, and uh, when I wanted to be when I grew up was certainly not in HR. I didn't even know it existed. I was a, I was a farm kid. Uh, and it wasn't until I was in my late 20s and I was actually a program manager in IT uh, that I learned what HR was because my manager at the time told me that HR uh, didn't approve a salary increase she'd promised me. So uh, that's when I went to learn what is this HR group that has this, this weird power uh, to be able to do that. Um, so long story short, a couple months after that, I bumped into the VP of HR and uh, gave him what I thought was a convincing argument for more money. Uh, I didn't get more money at that exact time, but what I got was a couple months later an offer to join the HR team to do analytics for union negotiations. And so here we are years later. Uh, what I actually wanted to be when I grew up, uh, I wanted to be a veterinarian. Uh, what I learned during college is that I hated organic chemistry and all things associated with that. So there went my vet dreams uh, and um, we, we all kind of transition in life into unexpected careers. And here I am. I love that. I think in almost uh, every situation where I ask that question, nobody's like, I wanted to be a human resources or in people, you know, operations when I was eight years old. So I always think it's interesting to to look back and see fast forward to today, you are a leader in HR and in people, and it's in the name of the interview series. So I have to ask, you know, when we're thinking about this dynamic thing of company culture, especially as the team continues to grow and, and change, how are you thinking about measuring this from both a qualitative and quantitative way? Oh, <laughs> culture is such a... Uh, um, ever-changing and, and kind of a multiple tentacled uh, thing to try and measure. Um, I will say that uh, in thinking about how to measure it, we, we all take away learnings from each and every job, right, and every company that we've been in. Uh, and I'm really delighted that over the past decade, culture has just been proven over and over to be such a, a core part of a successful company. Um, qualitatively, I'd say what I've learned is, is the value of systematically paying attention to anecdotes. And anecdotes are all those stories that, that people, uh, that employees and managers are telling you, um, all those little comments that are that are made that when you print string them together, you go, hmm, we seem to be trending in this direction or trending away from something, or this seems to be forming into something. And so it's how do you how do you pay attention to those and start to kind of mind map or otherwise map them into a larger storyboard? Um, I think uh, the other thing I learned in earlier career moments is, is really about the importance of, of looking at the, the inverse uh, of what was being told. In other words, what was the opposite of what somebody told me? What's the white space? What isn't being said out loud? Uh, so oftentimes, if you, if you go and deliberately probe into that, uh, people are very transparent in sharing uh, things that are both working and not working about the company culture or ways in which local teams have adapted uh, the culture that might be brought better for the broader network. So uh, very much into the stories and the anecdotes. Um, quantitatively, uh, I think the biggest learning I've had there is that the precision counts in the questions you ask, particularly if you're going to be doing a survey in which you don't know the specific context in which the person's answering the question. Uh, because at the end of the day, from a quantitative standpoint, people data is imperfect. We're all very subjective. We all um, uh, aren't even sure ourselves sometimes of what we're feeling, what we're trying to work it through as we're answering the question. So whenever we're uh, asking people to supply information about their experiences and about their emotions, we have to we have to be aware that they're providing it from a very moment in time perspective often, and that that is subject to change. So uh, 
All that said, I think the other thing that I would comment here is in HR, we're really starting to benefit from applying big data principles. In other words, how can we optimize performance by providing employees with data back about their own performance? Uh, how can we use data to, to provide more differentiated and more personalized employee and candidate experiences, et cetera? So a lot of work in this area. Absolutely. A lot of work, not just one data point, both in the qualitative and quantitative ones, but really looking at that full picture, being intentional around the questions that are asked and uh, coming at it from a, a lens of curiosity as well. And it's really helpful when formulating those questions and, and looking at the data to have that North Star or those values. Um, you mentioned kind of guiding principles too in relation to data. What are the guiding principles of resilience? <laughs> So my team will tell you that I start every new initiative by asking them to think deeply about the guiding principles, and they will probably tell you they're sick of the North Star analogy. We also use a little bit of you're climbing the mountain and there's no straight path to the top of the mountain. Um, so how do we just make sure that we are staying within that directional uh, appropriate path? Uh, but guiding principles are so important because when they're done right, they free up the team to run fast and develop it out the, the program or the tools or the services. Uh, more importantly, they free up the team to make decisions and iterate on those decisions quickly because if the guiding principles are done right, everybody's aligned on what are our, our overarching priorities, uh, you know, whether that's the customer externally, whether it's an internal customer moment, et cetera. Um, if I think about HR, before I go back to your question about resilience, a recent example that I love uh, within our HR team that we came up with applies to a recognition program we're about to launch. Um, and it's, it's as simple as this. A winning team is more successful than a team of winners. And so how do we appreciate those who lift and inspire others across resilience? So that's an example of kind of a programmatic uh, guiding principle. When we think about the broader uh, uh, resilience uh, corporation, it actually started in 2020, uh, and I joined in early 2021. Um, and, and just a little backdrop, resilience started because biomanufacturing has been under-resourced and it hasn't kept up with scientific innovation. Um, but one of the guiding principles that we're applying in decisions being made today across resilience that really resonates with me is, is this. Never forget the end user of the products we make. We manufacture products with utmost quality and rigor. And I really like this one because it's straightforward. It helps guide difficult conversations and decisions. And it connects with our overall mission about building a safer and healthier world uh, by enabling access to medicines uh, through our excellence in biomanufacturing. Building a safer and healthier world. I love the analogy with the, the winning team as well. I think that's also really important to remember too. The other piece you were talking about is really leveraging that, that data. How do you really use that data to make insights driven uh, decisions around HR and people at resilience as well? <laughs> Great question. Uh, when I started with resilience, we were just under 300 people. Uh, we've grown, but we're really just building out our data and reporting capabilities now uh, in resilience. Uh, but when you think about the foundation of it, uh, you really have to think about what data is most likely going to expose or flag trends or concerns that we need to pay attention to, both on the positive and the negative side. Uh, so an example I, that comes to mind is while we look at overall attrition, of course, um, what we really closely inspect right now for us is new hire attrition because it serves as such a strong signal for many areas uh, that we need to pay attention to, ranging from our recruiting and interviewing processes um, to our culture. Are we walking the talk in, as we're building our culture uh, and what we've sold the candidates uh, is our culture uh, to managerial effectiveness? So um, we'll continue to build this out uh, and we'll continue to pivot based on business needs. Uh, but it, the root of it is uh, what data is going to most inform trends, concerns, and decisions. I think that's an interesting lens of, of looking at things as well. And I know when we um, and our team was talking earlier as well, this kind of goes to how you think about problem solving at a larger Scale too. Um, if you could tell me a little bit about your approach to not starting off necessarily with the with the product and thinking about the ideal outcomes when you're working on a problem, uh, we'd love to hear that. 
Yeah, it's so tempting sometimes when a, when there's a good salesperson who's telling you just buy the system and it'll solve all your problems. Uh, but at the end of the day, we can't we can't let the system dictate our processes. Um, so I, you know, we talked about guiding principles a moment ago. We talked about data. Those are both components of of starting to think about what problem are we trying to solve. But I'd say we really can't be afraid in HR to pull our employees into our problem statement. Uh, I think sometimes we get hung up on having the answers uh, and then bringing them into the problem statement, but instead going, we don't have all the answers. We wanna engage you in helping us co-develop the answers. Uh, it, it can go such a long way. And then I think the other thing in HR is we can't be afraid to launch an imperfect product and be transparent that it'll change, it'll adapt, it'll morph based on user feedback. Uh, what's on, uh, what's important for us is to make sure we've got that, that fundamental foundation as close to, to good as we can. Uh, but the product itself, uh, just launch, launch the basics and, and start to build on that. Um, and that was hit home um, when I had a key review session with, with just an incredibly brilliant person. I was trying to build a reporting dashboard with all these bells and whistles. And, and he basically said, take it back to just the very few basics, test, iterate, refine, test, iterate, refine. And I've, I've taken that ever since um, on, on the HR side. So this means sometimes we're going to do an initial launch with manual processes so we can quickly test and iterate before configuring into an HR system or before buying a, a system or an app. But basically, even if you buy a system, start with the basics and then configure afterwards. Don't start with the complexity and don't let the system dictate uh, what you need to do. Absolutely. Don't start with the complexity. And also, it's never too late to iterate on our process, especially with feedback. And also, uh, perfectionism is, is not good to really set that goal to because, you know, in reality, nothing is, is perfect uh, in life or in systems or processes as well. We're all moving, living, dynamic beings too. Um, I know over the past few years, something that a lot of folks have been working on as well is just their communication, communication with their team, employees, really leading with empathy. You mentioned the word transparency, which I think is really important to demonstrate as a leader, as a team. What are the ways you're effectively communicating these big decisions, outcomes, results, or changes, and really demonstrating transparency with resilience? Oh, I wish I had a great answer for you. <laughs> Like all of us over the past couple of years, wow, this has been a work in progress, right? Um, just uh, so many facets of how we used to communicate and how we used to interact has is, is totally changed, case in point, us on, on the Zoom call. Um, so it's really just uh, always trying to figure out what's the best way to get the right level of information to the teams that need it at the time they need it. Um, if you can get those three things right, man, you're golden. Uh, I think we experiment and fail far more often than we truly succeed. You know, we're doing a lot with common tools like Slack or, or email newsletters. We're experimenting with virtual meetings like a CEO stand-up call. Uh, we're basically trying to figure it out just like everybody else, how to best engage. Uh, so if anybody's listening right now and has a good idea, hit me up after this. Uh, would love to love to hear it. That's completely fair as well and also relates to what we were talking about too in terms of there's no perfect one way to communicate as well. You have these different channels, you have different ways of, of communicating too. Um, and I want to ask in terms of systems, what are some of the, the tech you're using to really streamline or make your processes more efficient? We love efficiency here. <laughs> Um, you know, Workday is our backbone for people data. Um, so I think if you think in terms of efficiency, uh, what's interesting to me is how much uh, people data needs to feed into other systems. If you think about email distribution lists, if you think about all the digital security needs, if you think about um, ERP approval chains, all of that comes from the HRIS system. So one of the things I'd first say is if you're, if you're in charge of people tech, uh, make sure you are not getting caught up in having to deliver all this data to all of these other systems that need your data via manual processes. By all means, pipe it directly into the system so you've got real-time changes. You know, big companies have that dialed in. I'd say the smaller the company is, the more it tends to be manual, and that just is, is incredible rework and very painful. So um, I, if there's nothing else I would advocate for there, it's, it's making sure that uh, you're driving efficiency in your data flows uh, and avoiding manual processes and manual data feeds wherever possible. Uh, and I think rather than talk about specific tech, I, I would just 
kind of pivot my answer to expand on what I said earlier, right? Like it's so tempting to hit the easy button and buy a pre-configured system and adapt your programs around that, but you really have to, to avoid that. You don't want to incur the risk of not helping build your culture or truly meet your employees' needs. So you really have to work backwards from what's the culture we're really focused on building and optimizing and what do our employees and our managers really need or, or even strongly prefer and how can we meet that? Then get into the system little bit of reverse engineering, really thinking about the goalpost and the ideal outcome as you are talking about as well. Mm -hmm. I definitely want to touch on that performance management piece too in tech. You talked about, you know, not doing things manually too, which I definitely agree with. Is there a difference in the impact in helping manage performance management with tech uh, that you leverage? And if so, what is the impact on remote compared to really on-site employees as well, since I know you have a mix of folks working at Resilience? Ah, so yeah, good question. Um, I, I think some of the things I've been saying kind of come together if uh, if we talk about our performance review framework, because uh, we, we used Workday, uh, but but the framework we set up is really, we call it freedom within a framework, um, which is kind of a little catchy phrase. I, I thought the team did a brilliant job coming up with. But specifically what we do is we give data back to the employees and the managers. So we ask employees, not to provide reams and reams of data. We don't ask managers to provide reams and reams of conversational data. What we do is we set up a, a, about a half a dozen questions that we ask quarterly. Think of it as a brief voluntary survey that the employee, their manager, and their leadership team have complete transparency into. It's a tool for themselves to prompt specific conversations around topics such as goals, such as appreciation, such as are you getting the support you need to do the job you have today? Uh, and then in HR, we use this data not to inspect the conversations, uh, but to inspect the outcomes of the conversations. Is the employee feeling that they're getting the right guidance to, to keep moving forward with high velocity? Uh, do they feel they have the right connection with their manager, et cetera? So uh, I think this is, uh, this is something that uh, is getting really good feedback, and we're, we're uh, in, in year one, and we're iterating on it for, for year two to say, how do we, how do we optimize this theme? Absolutely. And that comes back to the point of really asking great questions and then following up on them and really kind of inverting what people are saying, as well as you were talking about. Uh, someone brought up this, this question in our last meeting, and I, and I love it, want to incorporate it in these interviews as well. It's the, the magic wand question is, if you had a magic wand, what would make your day easier? <laughs> uh, can I pick five magic wands? Uh, <laughs> Uh, to me right now, and it, it goes back to the question I didn't answer, which is kind of that on-site versus virtual. Um, I think we've come so far in being able as human beings to, to manage in that virtual world. But if I had a magic wand, uh, sometimes I'd really still like to have that teleportation to be able to just have that 15 minute conversation. Uh, because um, sometimes setting up the meeting and having the meeting turns uh, informal brainstorming or informal kind of just wanting to chat about various topics into a more formal meeting and, and you lose a lot there I think so that would be my magic wand for today I reserve the right to change it for tomorrow <laughs> I mean I love teleportation as an answer as well I just think having that FaceTime is important with folks and even if it's for 10-15 minutes it is really important as well for building meaningful connections and making sure people feel like you uh, see here and understand them as well. I want to talk about specifically the industry and the changing nature of human resources, people, especially in the language as well. Uh, we've seen a uh, different trajectory. And then over the past few years, a lot of folks coming to people in HR team saying, can you fix everything and anything and really having that large strategic seat at the table I think that is so important people are your greatest assets what is the current perception of hr and people teams uh in your opinion and where would you like it to be a year from now Ooh, uh generically speaking i think hr continues to make progress in 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 so many different directions um i think what COVID and virtual work exposed is that, you know, uh, HR definitely um, has, a, uh, is a very nuanced field. There's no single answer that you can repeat over and over and be considered, you know, wise and, and, uh, and productive and all that. Uh, but it's really nuanced based on what are the current needs at that moment in time and what's the current culture in that moment in time, what's the current leadership pressure points at that moment in time. So 
if I if I bring it into resilience, I think the current perception for us has been uh, we focused on talent acquisition in our first eighteen months. It was all about build, build, build. Uh, what we're trying to do now, and where we need it to be a year from now, is is much more focused in on how do we help employees who joined us uh, truly optimize their careers, their growth, uh, and and their long term success with resilience. So. Bottom line is, I think the perception uh, morphs based on all the different changing industry and company uh, currents uh, flowing through the river. Uh, and we, we can't be static in HR on what we're going to be a year from now. Absolutely. Can't be static, can't use business as usual, and just things the way things are, and they will be this way forever in time as well, and really empowering folks uh, to really thrive in their job, really move with velocity, as you were talking about. Mara, is there anything throughout our conversation that I didn't ask that you want to share with folks, or maybe underscoring key takeaways you hope people bring with them? Uh, I love the questions you asked, so thank you. Uh, this is this has been kind of fun, just kind of kind of riffing with you on this. Um, I'd say insights. I hope listeners bring. Oh wow! Anything around communication and change management. Always looking for better ways to get three hundred and sixty communication and information sharing out in this virtual kind of rapid paced world. Um, so uh, you know, let's let's use the tools that we all collectively have, like LinkedIn or whatever else it is, and, and let's stay connected. Yes, let's use the tools, stay connected, really build that sense of community. Nobody is in it alone. Mara, thank you so much for being on Reimagining Company Culture this afternoon. It was really my pleasure. Thank you. Of course, and as a reminder for folks who are listening on All Voices, we really believe in employees and employers being seen, heard, and understood. and know it's a requirement for the business to succeed overall. Have a great rest of your day, everyone.